Let's do it. Well, my heart rate up. So that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's one way to do it. Get kicked out of your own meeting. <laughs> that's a, well, appreciate it. Okay. I don't know what just happened, but let's hope that doesn't happen again. I will uh, pull up our slides. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, let me get our presentation started and we'll make this a really important, uh, very insightful. Uh, webinar over the next hour. Please ask questions as we go. I'll kind of show you how to do that in just a second. But let me introduce our expert panelists. We, again, are so excited and I'll be, be partners, but to learn um, from this amazing district and these amaz amazing individuals that you're going to hear from today. I want to first start with, on my left, Sean Spolsky. He is the STEAM Lab Specialist at Cobb County Schools in Georgia. And Sean, would you like to just say a few words about yourself as we get started? Hi, yeah, I'm Sean Spolsky. I've been teaching uh, 15 years and and uh, education isn't just my job, it's, it's my life's passion. And I'm in the middle, so I'll just go next real quick. I'm Jen Olson, I'm the president and founder of IHT, and again, just kind of along for the ride on this very informative webinar. Um, I'd like, next, I'd like to go to Dr. Sally Creel. She's the STEAM and Innovation Supervisor of Cobb County Schools. And Sally, would you like to say a few words? Everybody, I'm just excited to have the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, I think this is year 26 for me, so um, I have a real passion for all things that in integrate movement and science and technology, and then, of course, integrating the arts. And on the right-hand side of our slide, Pam Kane, she's the principal at Mapleton Elementary and from the Cobb County School District as well. And Pam, would like, you like to say a few words? Hey there, thanks for having me tonight. I'm happy to be with you all and excited to talk about this because anytime we can talk about kids and what's good for kids, it's a good thing. So I'm happy to be here to do this. Fantastic. All right, well, let's get started. We do want to have a couple of goals today that we really want to leave you with so that you've got some resources and something things you can do tomorrow to get started with this really innovative vision. So we want to share what Cobb County School District is doing with STEM and that whole child focus and linking the physical, emotional, and mental learning. Uh, we want to just explain the incredible program that Sean Spolsky has developed called EduSize and our partnership with IHT, what it is, the best practices, and then some ideas to integrate into your vision, and then the impact it's making, obviously showing that student growth through data and really proving um, how, how we're moving the needle in that whole child education. So we also want to help you drive your program through data and innovation and ways to integrate kinesthetic learning our IHT HARI monitors into your STEAM, physical education, social emotional learning curricula. Uh, let us help you create your strategy. We have everything from grant resources to help you find the funding to roadmaps to help you kind of figure out what that vision is and, and where you're gonna end up with those reports and that data at the end of the day. Uh, so those are things that we'll kind of talk about today. On the, everybody knows Zoom these days, so I don't really need to explain how Zoom works, but there is a Q and A button and we really would love for you to ask questions as we go. There's going to be a lot of information, a lot of knowledge. So let's make sure that we share that um, as we go and not wait till the end. So hit the Q&A button as we go and we're going to try it right now. So everybody that is a participant and actually our, our panelists too, if you can put a number of how you're feeling right this minute into the chat box based on one through five and I want to Thank Sally for kind of putting this together. But if everybody can just go to the chat box, it is up in, I can find the chat box here. I move this, just go ahead and put a number in there and that will give us um, you know, a chance to make sure that we've got that going. Oh, there's chat, okay, great. All right, all right, four, two, put a, uh, yeah, four seems to be, you know, really fun. So we're, we, we're, we're based in Austin, Texas. And so we're sort of in fall, but it still feels like summer. So four is sort of that um, island feel. So, all right. Well, thanks guys for uh, testing the chat and let's get on with the show here. So I'm gonna start just explaining what IHT is really briefly. So we obviously are based in our, the heart of our program is through heart rate technology. And you can see here the zone. Um, I was just lit up in the yellow zone, which is an elevated heart rate because I got kicked off. So my heart rate just standing here um, through emotions um, and nervousness and anxiety shot up into that yellow zone. I took a couple of breaths, I came back down into the blue and I hope I stay there the rest of this webinar. Uh, and, and as you can see, as that heart rate even elevates further, it goes to the red zone. And the way that we really try and help students 
self-manage that, whether it's a physical emotion or a, a, a um, emotional emotion is through, um, you can kind of see some examples. So when they see that monitor, they know they're either exerting in those certain examples of moderate activity, vigorous activity, resting, or their emotions can play in that. So we're really trying to help kids become that, build that autonomy. And so that they then can tap into source and understand like, okay, I'm in the yellow zone. What do I need to calm down and regulate myself? And as we're going to talk about today, how do we bring that into our academic or STEM classrooms so that we can enhance memory and learning and retention and self-confidence and have fun um, as we're learning really challenging subjects like math um, and some of our other STEM courses. So with the monitor, basically the students wear it in either their classes, whether STEM classes, as Sean's gonna explain, um, or physical education, recess, or all day, um, if they're gonna be really trying to be mindful of and aware of how they're feeling um, throughout the day in their emotional state and also their 60 minutes of physical activity. That all connects back into the district level and to the cloud. And then we can basically take the data and from an academic attendance, behavior, physical education, um, principal referrals, everything that you want to put in there, we can, can take that data and we can merge it together to link the whole child. That data then can be shared with administrators, with State Department of uh, Education, parents, students get daily reports. Um, so the ability to have all stakeholders involved is really the key because it's not just about collecting the data. It's like, can we take this data and then show how we can get better and learn and fill in those gaps further to grow our program. So driving our programs through that data. We have a way to do this in the classroom. And then we also have a mobile app, uh, which is what I'm using um, right now. And so as you, know, you can kind of see on my screen here, I'm controlling the monitor, if I can get this right, um, through my phone. And as I turn that off, it'll turn my monitor off. And then it gives the kids a chance to have a few things. So emojis to say how they felt. And then there's a journal entry here so they can tap on that. I can do this upside down and type in how they're feeling. So we're just really trying to capture not only on the real time data in the moment, but then we're trying to give them that reflective time and then build that over time. So how did you do today? How does that compare to yesterday? So let's try and get better tomorrow. So that real-time feedback um, that goes straight to them. We also have online resources. We have an entire online department uh, with curriculum. Um, Sean's gonna go into really the, what he's been working on his curriculum. So I'm gonna stop right there and um, you know, just kind of the ways that we've used our schools, but I wanna get it to our panelists now so that you kind of have an understanding of what IHT is. But these are the ways that we're impacting schools. And obviously the last one, that kinesthetic learning um, with Cobb County School District and EduSize is where we'll head to next. So I'm gonna hand it over to Sally, Dr. Sally Creel, uh, you know, heading up the vision. And can you just explain to us what is the vision of STEM in Cobb County? Sure, so we're very fortunate that we work in a district that is open to autonomy. So we know that there isn't a model for schools that one size fits all, which is one of the things we love about uh, what Sean and Jen are actually gonna share, is that our schools have diverse needs. Our schools look differently from one another. And so our vision and our mission is to really uh, support all of our schools and help them develop their unique STEM identity. So what is it that they need? What is it that meets the needs of their culture, Their their stakeholders, what is it that they can do and how can they enhance what they're already doing that's amazing. We're, we're fortunate to work in a district that is a really strong district that has a lot of amazing things happening. And then how can we do to, what can we do to really enhance that type of learning? So we really want them to cultivate those skills that they're gonna be able to use in the future. So self-management, self-regulation, understanding how to integrate movement and how that's part of a healthy lifestyle. Those are all life skills that they'll be able to take with them as they transition, not only from where we're looking at right now at an elementary school, but into middle school, into high school, and then on into their lives. Fantastic. And let's uh, go to the next um, slide. And I don't know if you want to expand on this. We kind of just went through all of um, this, you know, the goals, but does anything else to add? With sure. this? Just, I mean, when we started our, um, our STEM department, and for anybody that's on the call or maybe watching this later, and they're trying to kind of understand kind of the vision for STEM and kind of how it can grow or develop, you know, we started with awareness of what is it. So this is most certainly a STEM resource or STEM product. You saw Jen was talking about using the app and the interface and then having the digital or wearable technology, which is a 
cutting edge piece and something that uh, the future we know that there's going to be a lot of jobs and a lot of employment opportunities in wearable tech and how wearable tech can help you not only with your job, but just your quality of life. So that's an awareness. This is STEM and these are STEM resources that you're interacting with. We want to hire teachers to have access to quality learning opportunities, which Sean is going to share with you some things that they've been able to implement at their school where Pam is the principal and they'll, they'll share some of those resources. But we really want to strengthen those, those partnerships with the community or this the general STEM community at large, which Jen helps represent. And um, we always are trying to recognize great things that are happening. And um, Mableton is one of our schools that has won many awards. They are certified known not only with our own district STEM certification, they've earned our state STEM certification, and they've also um, read their, um, what else have they read? I'm sorry. Advanced Ed. Yes, Advanced Ed, which is now called Cognia certification for their STEAM practices. So they are definitely an exceptional school. Fantastic. Well, let's uh, just have a couple of questions and I'm gonna bring both you at the district level and Pam, you know, principal at the at the school level. Um, Sally, why don't you start, like what are some of the keys to success that you've you had in that, those areas of learning? And, um, and then Pam, if you can follow up on that at the school level, like where are you guys driving this from at your, in your roles? And what are the so, those keys to success? General, just in general, things that we found that are helpful our students are able to learn better when we integrate the movement pieces. Um, I think that that, I mean, that's not new, but maybe focus on, you know, we always wanted them to have recess or we wanted them to make sure they got the opportunity to go to physical education. Well, now what we've been able to do through this program is really capitalize on that and showcase how you can bring that into the classroom. And in, by incorporating that movement aspect in the classroom, you're really going to enhance the learning, which is, um, a key reason why we're in school every day is that student academic success. Okay. And Pam, want to answer that question? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the keys to the success at Mableton in particular and in all schools is student engagement. When students are engaged in the learning, they're excited about it, they're having fun, and they don't might not even realize how much they're learning. And when kids are engaged, they're behaving. And so that really, it helps our behavior across the school um, when they are implementing this sort of thing. When, when kids go to Sean's lab, they behave because they're engaged. He never has any, well, I can't say never because that's just, you know, we never, you can't say never, but he does not have behavior problems in there. He doesn't have discipline write-ups because they're engaged and it's such a fast pace. And he's also so bought into it. Um, and that would be the second thing really, that student engagement. And then secondly, teacher buy-in. So if a teacher believes in what they're doing, the kids know that. And so for Sean in particular, he believes in what he's doing and, and our other teachers do. They believe in STEM, they believe in STEAM, they know it's good for kids. And so that helps us to be successful because they believe in it. Well, that's, you know, I'm not gonna just take this to the next step and audience, if you can kind of see in the chat, if you could put in one way that you're finding success, as a company, we have really driven our program through the physical education classrooms and departments across the country and the world. Uh, but, you know, Sean, I want you to kind of take this as I lead into your introduction and how you got here and how we got together. But, uh, you know, we how do how did you first merge with the physical education department? And maybe you can share that story of how you brought PE, the movement and the academic together to make this incredible program. Yeah, I guess um, I think I had that one of the slides coming up, right? <laughs> um, but I just. I'm really brief. I just want to tell the attendees just briefly about myself. I guess I've been teaching 15 years and what brought me to Mableton was actually Sally. She's like, Sean, you need to go learn what STEM is. I'm like, what's STEM? And this is like eight years ago now because she's like, you need to write curriculum on this. I'm like, okay. So I went over there and got trained and managed to get a job over there. And then I've been the STEM lab teacher for the past seven years in that. And I can't say uh, how amazing it's been, but uh, really growing up as a kid, I was that kid in class who was always told to sit still and be quiet. And, and I decided to become a teacher at a young age because I wanted to make learning fun. I wanted kids to move. I wanted, I wanted to do things that people weren't doing. You know, you go back uh, to Frederick Frobel when he developed, designed kindergarten. It was based upon uh, play, play, imagination, and the teacher being the guide. And I look at myself as a guide. And, you know, I've been fortunate to win lots of cool awards over the years, some state teacher of the year, but now I'm in presidential awards. And, uh, 
I just graduated in college again this summer and I never thought I'd have three college degrees. So <laughs> good times. <laughs> well, and you want to talk a little about uh, Pam and you guys working together as well and sort of building this vision and kind of what, what the makeup of, of the school is. Yeah, so our, we're a Title I school. We've been a Title I school since 2012. And that just means that we've got over 50% of our students receive free and reduced lunch. So they're coming to us kind of on that lower socioeconomic, um, from that lower socioeconomic families. We have diversity in terms of ethnicity. You can see our Hispanic population, African-American, white, and multiracial. And so it's, it's a place where we try to create what we like to call an ultimate learning experience for all of our kids. And so that, that's who we are. We, we have over a thousand students now because of the situation we're in, we've got 600 face-to-face -face and about 400 are virtual. So it's, it's got some new challenges, but the kids are still engaged and we're still, we think it's our responsibility to create this, this ultimate learning experience for them. They don't have a choice of what school to go to. They live in our district. And so they come to our school and they get to come to our school. And when they do, then they're receiving some amazing education and they're having so much fun. And on days, like we have certain days during the school year on a typical school year, we'll have a STEAM showcase where we have lots of people from across the, the county, the state, and even the nation sometimes come into our school. And you wouldn't believe the excitement on those kind of days when everybody's involved in this activity and, and the whole STEAM and EduSize and all of this movement on the same day. It's just there's such an energy in the building. Um, and that's neat on those days because you can see it everywhere and feel it everywhere. But every day you see that in Sean's class, and then you see it in other classes too when they are implementing this type of work. So it sounds like it's real infectious. It's it's really built mm -hmm. everybody to get involved with it. Well, let's talk yes, about um, what EduSize is. And again, if you have questions as we kind of go through this, we'd love to answer them so you can kind of get a real sense of how this can scale and can you know fit into your program as well. So Sean, why don't you take from here? This is a video that we will uh, share when we do our resources. So all the resources that we're gonna share at the end of this will include the video so you can kind of see EduSize in action and everything um, that our panelists are talking about today. All right, so um, EduSize um, is, is a research-based curriculum. So I spent the last uh, year and a half developing this, designing it and putting the research in, you know, through uh, tons of hours of observations as well as teacher surveys, student surveys, so it's really been quite the process to uh, design and build, design and build this. So um, it's really designed based upon kinesthetic learning and, and all the K-5 lessons are specifically designed for the workshop model, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and I integrate the IHT monitors within my classroom in a wide variety of settings, from whether it's using the exercise games to working out in the garden, to working at our track, to there's many ways that I use these all the times with our students because they're engaged in their fun. And it's just like a perfect, perfect match. So um, how it got started actually was um, there's what we have in Cobb County is called the Cobb Tank. So Sally's in charge of that. And it's like kind of like um, Shark Tank. So you are in front of the panelists. So it took me three years to kind of really design the right idea. The first year I was trying to get a garden. And the second year I tried to do something in sports science, but I just didn't have the right concept. So my PhD department and myself, uh, I kind of, I thought of the word in the car while I was driving. I was trying to combine the word education, science and exercise all into one to one word. So that's where really exercise came about. So I had um, been able to test the IHT spirit bands from our head of PE in our county. And he let, me, he let us use them for two months. And I was like, wow, this is really engaging. Like we can totally go with this. And I was able to secure um, over $11,000 to start this program. And during the first year of the program, I realized I needed more. I'm like, I, I, I see, you know, how the kids are. I see some kids huffing and puffing within two minutes of exercise. I'm like, how can I get more movement in the classroom? And that's really when the new curriculum was born. And go ahead and talk about that. So um, the mission of my program is to um, inspire, motivate a generation of learners to a new way to achieve academically, socially, physically, and emotionally. What, what makes exercise so unique, it's really about feelings and making kids love school and not be afraid. You know, I never thought I'd develop a 72 lesson math curriculum when I've been terrible at math my whole life. <laughs> it would have been the first thing I ever thought I would develop. Um, but the vision is really to find a new way to use physical activity movement to motivate students to uh, academic achievement. 
So the idea of all the games is taking the lessons and adding in academic competition with fitness competition. So the kids are starting to become more motivated to get better grades and to increase our student math achievement through uh, kinesthetic learning, to let them value the personal, social, emotional well-being while embracing the growth mindset. And as much as I love technology, being a STEM lab teacher, I realize that kids have it much too often as, as all the research shows. It doesn't matter if you're in an SES school or a wealthy area, we have kids spending anywhere from six hours to 12 hours a day in a device and, and that's not healthy. I really like this image right here. It's about standards.org. Uh, org. It, it really talks about how the majority of the day students are spending four and a half hours a day. So roughly, you know, school is a little over six hours a day, roughly. You know, you add in from going to the bus, getting to school, from sitting at the carpet, sitting at their tables, you know, exercise is what, what changes this data and what, what can be a huge way of decreasing childhood obesity and childhood overweight. And I want to pause and just ask uh, first Sally and then Pam, if you can respond. When Sean, when they made their presentation, what was what was your reaction to kind of seeing this vision in the when they first brought it out to the Shark Tank opportunity? I, I have to say, number one, I've known Sean for a number of years. Um, I think I met him as a baby teacher, maybe his second year teaching, and yeah. he up and he goes, I want to learn how to develop curriculum and I want to learn how to do this and I want to help teachers and you could just see his passion for it. So I'm, and he's always been a very creative and divergent thinker, which we need more of that in education. We need less of the same and something new and different because we know that the brain and the body, we crave novelty. We crave that opportunity for innovation and that opportunity to do some things differently. And so when they started pitching the idea, I was just sitting there going, this is brilliant. Um, I'm a teacher's child. I grew up, my mom is a P or was a PE teacher my whole life. So I grew up having to do the movement every time. If I happened to walk by her class, even if I was in high school or whatever, she would pull me into her elementary PE class to demonstrate the proper technique for whatever she was doing. So, I mean, I, I know the value and the engagement and the excitement that comes from giving the kids the opportunity to move. And when you saw Sean and Ricky, who was his partner, who is the PE teacher at Mableton, you saw what they were developing and how they were thinking differently. It was, it was infectious. I was in a room of like 26 other educators watching all the pitches. And when theirs came on, everybody in there went, yes, we need this. And Pam, how about you from the school level? What, what was your thought when Ricky and Sean kind of brought this idea to you and you know, from you have to support all teachers and your every department, and that these were kind of coming together in a way that we all hope that we work together as a staff and really that comprehensive student wellness model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one thing that's so good about it is it is it is interrelated. So it's not just about PE. It's not just about science or math math or one thing. It's about what's good for kids and getting them um, active and getting their brains alert and helping them with obesity too. But getting those brains alert so that then they can take on more learning. And so, I mean, the enthusiasm, yes, it's definitely, it, it's easy to, to catch that and to, to be ready to say yes, but um, they have the research, research to back it up and that makes a big difference. And yes, I do have to consider the whole picture, the big picture for the school and, and consider, does this, is it in alignment with the vision of the school and is it good for kids and is it sustainable? And in this case, all of those, the answers were yes to all of those. And then the enthusiasm, is fabulous. And um, just the, um, I guess, reputation, or maybe that's not the right word, but just seeing that that Sean has had I many ideas and they are super creative and he follows through with them. And that's so fabulous. So it's not just like, let's do something fun, even though that is his mantra, have fun, but it's right. have fun, but he's going to stick with it. So when he says, I'm going to develop a curriculum, he's going to develop a curriculum and it's going to get better and better because he's constantly reflecting and, and, and um, problem solving and just continue to work at it. And you, do, you don't always find that, I find a lot of people have some great ideas and they wanna start something and get something going or get me to buy something, but the, the follow through and the sustainability really sets this apart from other people and from other programs or activities. I think Pam mentioned a really key detail was that it's, it's based in our standards. So it's what we're already teaching, but we're teaching it using a different technique or a different approach. 
which is integrating that movement piece, which is really what our kids are craving. Um, we see a lot of, if students aren't necessarily the most successful academically, then we sit down and we, for lack of a better term, we use drill and kill. Well, that's not working. So let's try a different approach that is going to be more engaging for those students and help them learn it in a different way that's going to engage not only their minds, but their bodies and their minds at the same time, giving them that opportunity for that total physical response to learning. That's great. Well, Sean, you want to just kind of talk a little bit about, you know, kind of getting into the lessons and those 72 that you developed and how they integrate and then the data that you can show that these are really, you know, the curriculum is really making a difference on uh, those academic and SEL scores and physical education. So um, the, these are just screen grabs from my website. So exercise.com has some more information. You can see videos of kids playing the games, uh, kind of how it started. But um, all the games are, you know, like really cheesy names I just come up with. <laughs> well, I'm just, and I, I, I designed these just as an engineer would. I literally will go to the store and I buy some. How it all started really was I, I asked Pam, I said, Pam, I said, could you lend me, could I use, I think I started with $1,000 of school funds. And I'm like, I'm just gonna buy some stuff that I think I can design games with. And I'm just gonna go ahead through the design process like I do with the students. So really that's how the curriculum was born. I just started small with things like uh, magnetic darts. And then I moved on to like 120 charts. I'm like, okay, how can I incorporate? So I kind of started tossing and throwing, but then I really started thinking about the workouts that I do. So I have like fagility, speed cones, tap the line, cool size, all, all these different interesting games that not only when the kids hear the words, they're engaged right because it just sounds fun. But when they play it and do it, they're actually moving their bodies, they're sweating, they're engaging. And, and it's incredible. I mean, they're, they're learning math so much faster. I mean, and that's really what we we're going for because what I did was I analyzed data for three, three years of our school data and math. And I, and I noticed that the trend was the same. It, it didn't matter what fifth grade class it was, we had really low scores in math. And when I talked to the teachers within the school, um, the biggest theme that they had was the students still are working on their addition facts and their multiplication and their basic problem. So by the time they're reaching fourth and fifth grade, they're really struggling uh, in those state mandated tests, which obviously we all hate, but we do have to recognize that those are there. So really this is designed to not only meet standards that are rigorous within themselves, but to help students gain that confidence that they didn't have. You know. It's, it's stunk in high school and middle school struggling through math and having to spend two hours a day doing math. So that's really why I tried to design this to, with, with all those kids in mind. And I, I had this picture that I took last year while I was doing, um, so one of my concepts is called burn, the burn and learn con classroom model, which is just like a kinesthetic classroom. But the kinesthetic classrooms that you see nowadays in schools are gonna cost you 50 to $100,000. Combining my, my program with IHT creates an affordable solution. And it also provides real-time data with real-time results. I mean, in 30 minute sessions, I would have eight stations going in my classroom in my steam lab. And like you said, right there, 6,793 calories burned in 30 minutes, like while learning and re doing those repetition of their standards. And I don't know if there's a curriculum out there where the kids are burning that much and learning and having fun at the same time. And and uh, what's great about IHT, for those of you who haven't used it before, I mean, it's real-time results, real-time data for the students immediately, which is what our kids need because they've been touching the device since they've been born. <laughs> so they need that immediate feedback. And what Edgesize does, the games are so fast-paced that they're getting that reward right away. They're able to start that game. They're able to build those social-emotional learning skills. They're able to learn the four Cs, collaboration, communication, creativity, all that happening in just a very natural environment, but it takes the teachers to do it. Um, and the teachers are the reason why it's successful. I just came up with the ideas and tested them out, but the teachers are the, are, are the stars and the students are the ones learning. And I, I'm just fortunate to have started this program at our school thanks to having good leaders around me. And Pam, I'm gonna ask you and, and Sally, if you can follow from Pam on what it's like to walk into a classroom where you've got lights on the monitors and um, kids are running around and they're learning all at the same time. What is that like walking into a classroom where Edusize and IHT are, are bringing this vision together? It's kind of loud, but it's a good, that's a good thing because we, 
the sound of children in, enjoying what they're doing is such a, a pleasant sound. So it's kind of loud because when you're playing a game, I, you can get a little competitive somewhat, but that's part of the engagement too. They are competitive with each other, but they are staying on, on target when it comes to the math that they're practicing. So if they're throwing the ping pong balls or the, the football ball through, through something, um, they're really talking about the math concepts are there that are there. Um, it's good partner, it's good communication. So yes, they're practicing the four C's. They're really having to talk with each other and collaborate. Um, and then when you do see them, when he's got them out on the track or somewhere and they've got their bands, they are so excited to watch it. They're really watching to see what's happening, what their heart rate's doing. So it just get, it just pulls them in to something that's good. And that's something that is getting their heart rate going and getting them moving around and they're smiling and that there's um, the sound of kids talking when they're happy and, and learning, but then the smiling too is so, so powerful. And we don't, we, we talk all the time about, we, we don't know where our, some of our kids are coming from or what kind of home they left that morning. We do know sometimes they're getting chewed out when they're getting out of the car in the morning. And that's just a, a terrible thing. But then to see them smiling and engaged and talking about math and, and cheering their friends on, then it makes it, it's just so, so powerful. And Sally, how about, how about you? What's your just, seen in action? I love seeing the kids lost in the learning. Um, some of our kids, they get, even as young as like fourth grade, third grade, fourth grade, they start getting this, uh, they've learned it either from their older, you know, brothers or sisters or some peer groups that they've been around, but they, you know, that it's not cool and they're supposed to act tough and not like they're liking things that they're doing but to see them get so lost and so engaged in what they're doing that they forget to be the cool kid and just are you know just being as fun and happy and competitive and light light-hearted I mean like Pam was saying that that is so needed in a classroom and I love coming in to see that controlled chaos it may, you know, appear from the outside somewhat chaotic, but it's not. I mean, there's a definite purpose behind it. And I mean, I think anyone at the district office who walked in and got to see that would jump right in the middle of it and like, hey, let me put a band on. Let me show you. How, I want to play this. Teach me what I'm doing right there. And that's, that's the best part. And they can't wait to show you. That's the other part. Like, they are so proud of what they're doing. And like, a lot of times I'll walk into a classroom, maybe a more traditional approach classroom, you know tell me what you're learning. And they'll say, I don't know, page 24, or, you know, why are you doing this? Because my teacher told me. That's not the response I get when I walk into this class setting and I walk into students that are doing this type of learning because they, they are 100% bought in. They know what's going on. They know why it's going on. They can explain how the heart rate monitor is working and they can explain what theirs is doing. So instead of being reliant upon that teacher to give them all the feedback, they are the owners of that. And so they have that agency and they have that opportunity to, you know, regulate their own movements, whatever they need to do using their own um, armband, which teachers that teach middle school and high school can say that's just invaluable that they are in charge of that, not waiting on someone else to tell them if they're doing a good job or if they've reached that target zone or, you know, have gotten a good grade, whatever. So um, that was a really long-winded answer to answer that. Right? The heart of learning is, you know, when you can become the master and, and own all that information and that uh, intelligence and that higher order thinking, uh, that's where we're doing our job as educators. And so when that student graduates, um, they know how, you know, they're managing the entire process. And so I think that's a really important key was a great point. Uh, and Sean, so why don't we go into what is the workshop model with EduSight? Okay. And just on the previous slide is really designed about multiple intelligences and then university design as well, because it meets the needs of our special education students as well. In my research, I observed um, moderate and severe intellectual disabilities as well, and it completely transformed classroom the teacher I mean she's like you should see the curriculum that I have to use in the district she's like it's kind of boring like this is making it so much more fun and they're actually understanding it for the first time in the whole year or so um but uh I'm gonna let Pam talk a little bit about the next slide which is the workshop model which is I've, I've taught my whole career as well but Pam is really an expert in this 
So it's it's really best practices and we it's workshop model, but it's also called other things in other places and we just start off all of our instruction with an opening and that's where the standards are introduced where we have a learning target. Uh, we say things like today you're going to learn so you're really telling the kids and setting the stage for what's coming up and this is usually some direct teaching and some modeling. Um, and that's the beginning part of the lesson and then the bulk of the workshop time is students hands on they're doing the work, so this is when the teacher can have them at stations or might have some small groups going on. If we're talking about reading then they're going to have a, a guided reading group during on that going on during that time. Um, lots of differentiation during the work time, because the teacher has that you know kids can be um, grouped into different groups or individualized work. Uh, but it's, that's when the hands on stuff happens and that's when kids are actually actively learning and actively engaged. And then we just close it out with the, the closing is what we call it or summarizing. And we know that that's a really, really important part of the lesson. And that's not direct teaching again, that's coming back and having the kids to show the rest of the students, here's what I did, here's, here's what I learned, here's an example. We have what's called document cameras in the classroom so they might put their project up under the document camera so that everyone in the classroom can see it. Or um, they might show something that they built out of Lego so that the whole class can see it. And they talk about how that's related to the opening or related to the standards of learning target that was introduced in the first place. And, and um, the curriculum can be used in any part of, part of this, is what, which is what makes it so easy and functional for any classroom. Um, and and uh, the space, the design is kind of like if you do beach body workouts at home, you just need a small room. And that's how I kind of structured the idea because we work in elementary school, we, we work in small spaces and we have to take advantage of those spaces. Not just put something up there. Just, it has to be there, but make it purposeful. And- um, Hold on, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm at here. Let's get back to the slide one second. Sorry about that. Okay. Somewhere. Well, hold on. Sorry about this, everyone. Let me see if I can pull these back up. There we go. Uh, how to get I didn't go see. What do I need to do? But I, I can keep talking about the uh, yeah. research as we're going here. So it took place in um, eight classrooms. There were K-5 classrooms from a math lab, and then each individual grade level, level as, as a also a Moid classroom. And essentially what I did was me and the teachers would meet for trainings and we also ran through our CCCs. So uh, training as well for other staff members. So throughout the school year, I was able to, anytime I had a new game or curriculum, I would pass it out, train the staff. And then that's how I was able to really get staff on board. Because at first, I mean, like Pam said, sometimes when we think of movement, we do think of loud. When we see a PE classroom, yeah, a PE classroom is going to be a, probably the loudest room in the, in the school, but that's okay. What's cool about these games is we can convert them larger scale as well, so they can be used in a PE uh, classroom as well. Um, so you can go on the next slide. Okay, let's see if I don't screw this up again. So I can get okay. Okay. <laughs> back um, this is just a fun quote um, from Plato, like back in the day, you know. We've already known the best way, to, you know, do not train a child to learn by force or harshness, but direct them to do it by what amuses their minds so they may be able to discover the, what the heck is the peculiar bent of each genius of each. And I think at schools nowadays, we have so much, teachers have so much on their plates, especially this year. Um, but I mean, the plates have continued to stack and it seems like it's to the ceiling. And it seems for some reason, we, we kind of forgot those, or, you know, how kindergarten did start and how we need playful learning. And those things are coming back. They're coming back in our formative observations. They're coming back in our observations when district personnel come through our schools, they're looking for playful learning. And schools are recognizing because of the power of STEM and STEAM, the kids need to play as well as, I mean, uh, middle school, high school is just starting to do more stations, more independent learning. So this curriculum really does a little bit of everything. So let's take a look at what the students have to say about uh, exercise curriculum. So I was able to survey well over 200 kids. I kind of got a whole bunch of them right here over the course of uh, last year. And 98.6% um, circled the heart emoji. And I kind of thought that was funny because there's only three outliers. 
and the outliers, right? I like them, but math is still sometimes hard. So they're still being honest. You know, um, some stuff I still don't know. Um, one kid wrote, since I learned multiplication in kindergarten, it was not helpful. <laughs> I mean, come on, you just gotta love the honesty of kids. But the overall arching themes in the next slide really that you find is, I mean, it's, it's fun, it's fun. And that's why we wanna be at school. I became a teacher to make learning fun. You know, exercise wasn't just something that dreamed up. It took 15 years. It took a lot of pedagogy. It took a lot of trial and error. It took a lot of learning to get there. And um, the kids, they know that, that it helps them learn. You know, it helps you. But my favorite quote when I was doing it was, it's like right, Dave and Busters. And I remember that was one of our students who does have some uh, severe social emotional learning issues. We're here to snap on a dime, you know, um, and to see him engage like that. I was like, wow, this is, this is something, you know, it helps you do multiplication, have fun at the same time. Like, I'm not going to read all these teacher quotes, but you can get more. But I really love this first one. Um, it gets the brain going. Once the brain is working, that's a muscle that's always taking and getting better and stronger. Doing this as a daily exercise of the brain gets the blood flowing. and allows me to get to my teaching. I feel like they take it more like a sponge. So one of the other overarching themes was teachers didn't have to worry about behavior management during uh, the station time anymore because the kids were engaged and they're self-reliant. Students were, you know, like down here, you can see I used to use test cards, you know, teachers would go buy stuff and teachers pay teachers and it's not really engaging. Yeah, it might look cute or something, but it's not fun. Like kids wanna have a good time. And if we don't make them love learning right away, and I've only worked in Title I schools my whole career. And I can't tell you how sad it is when I see a second grader or third grader who's already down on their luck at school. We have to find more ways of engaging them. And Edgesize and IHT provide this innovative practice that that needs to come into our schools more and what i mean this is my observation so technically i can't put this in my journal article that i'm writing i learned from my professor but uh throughout six hours of almost observation that i sat with a little um notepad to try to tally kids off task i didn't see one student off task and i'm sure pam can probably relay that as well but i mean to get that kind of data was I mean, I, I'd walk out of the rooms every day with goosebumps and I'm like, holy man, this is real. And for me to partner with IHT as one of their partners already, I mean, literally I'm still getting all of this off the board and it's a brand new company, but um, to see the value and to see what we need in, 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 in our schools and innovation is not going away. We can look at 2020 as the worst teaching years of our life and I'll say, I remember one day I went to Pam's office and I actually complained. I don't think she ever saw me complain. I was like, the CTLs program doesn't work. We're supposed to teach it on Monday. And you know what? I took this year, I've had a lot of hard hardships. I mean, my mom just died a couple of weeks ago, but you know, I've had a lot of hard things happen this year. And um, 2020 has been a good year. I've, I've grown, I've learned more. I've become a better teacher. I'm not gonna look back at this year and be like, oh, COVID this, COVID that. I'm looking at this and be like, hey, how can we change education for the future? How can we make every kid want to love school? And right now is our time. As educators, we must work together now and stop up. There's no excuses. We don't need 21. We just need to get better and, and just love, love what we do. Um, Definitely an opportunity, Sean. I think you have, you've grasped that. You're, you're, showing, you're showcasing how we can take this model and really use it as something that's going to be beneficial for all learners. I know that right now what you have available is integrated with math, the Regicize, but you're working next uh, into reading. Is that what it was? Or Yeah, my next goals are, I have my next seven new design games concepts ready to go. But I decided to push those on the back burner and start uh, working on phonics curriculum for ages probably three. I mean, honestly, it's good all the way up through elementary. I mean, I know middle schoolers that have needed some of those you know, a lot of these kids need that repetition and practice. And, and it's important that we don't look at us as, as teachers that, oh, the second grade teacher, fifth grade teacher must have done anything last year because this kid still can't read. You know, we got to provide those um, crutches or things that are adaptable to meet their needs. And what's really cool about the curriculum, the students adapted on their own. One day I was in a second grade class and I noticed that it was written only for facts to 20 and the kids were solving facts within hundreds because they adapt it on their own because that's how the design is. It's, it's meant to be whatever you want it to become. It doesn't have awesome. the lesson plan. 
Sean, I think you're the host now, so you could actually share um, the Google oh, slides from where we are. Oh, sure I am. Rights. Sure. Oh. Sure. Can you guys hear back on? And again, we apologize for the technical uh, difficulties on that. Hey, we all live in this world. We're used to it. It happens to all of us. I don't know. We've had. Uh, hey. Go ahead, Sean. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt if you guys. You're good. You can just go on to the next. Okay. Well, we're, uh, we just have a few minutes left, um, so we'll kind of get through these last slides. And what we want to kind of culminate with is to be able to share these resources, to be able to share the EduSize program, to be able to get started um, with that movement-based learning in your STEM classes. Um, so, Sean, do you want to kind of take us through these last few, and then we'll answer some questions yeah. um, at the end. I mean, you can find this on the website as well, EduSize.com. But really, not only does it make students love school, and make teachers better teachers. You can see in all the, on all this um, surveys here, teachers became more proficient math teachers. They had, even they believed more that students, that they're responsible for their achievement. You know, I was really surprised with a lot of the answers that I got. You know, they enjoyed teaching math more. Uh, just the, really the possibilities of what you can do with movement and games and gameplay and playful learning are really endless. And I think right now we're at a, a time that, we need to get these more into schools, so. Perfect. And um, you want to just kind of tell people can get more information? Yeah, so edgesize.com, you can watch videos of what it looks like. You can kind of get um, basic information and you can contact me through there to um, get started within your schools. And I'm obviously a brand new company, so I'm still working on a lot of these elements and I'm hoping by 21, I'll be ready for delivery. So, but I really wanted to share this a quote, I read this in a book called Teacherpreneurs that I had to read for an assignment this summer. <laughs> but uh, Roland Barth uh, suggested the public schools need to unlock the tremendous overabundance of underutilized talent that gets left in the parking lot every day. Um, I've been fortunate to work with principals, directors that believe in their teachers and let them create the new innovation practices. So don't ever sell your teachers short and um, I'm forever grateful for having such great mentors that I've worked with. Well, let's go ahead and um, kind of close. And I'm gonna start with Sally first and just sort of, you know, how you guys have built this model program and what does the expansion look like combining EduSize, IHT, we've kind of talked about like, you guys are really building a viable model that can scale throughout the district um, and maybe give some advice to some of the audience about how, how they can maybe even get a start on this and where you guys are in your process. Sure, with everything we do, we first thing we do is we start with um, teacher training. Um, our first priority is to make sure our teachers have the buy-in and understand how to utilize a resource. So we make sure not only that they um, have that buy-in and have the training, but they have access to the materials that we want them to use in their classroom. So we start there, we have a model that works strong. Uh, and once we have a model that works strong, we let others come and see that model and how it's working strong. We've done that with Mableton as a STEAM, a school that is leading in STEAM across the state and people come and see and learn from them. And this is the model that we also use to roll out new initiatives in the district. After we have that model going well and we've trained other teachers and other in other schools across the state, then we add to that and we bring them, um, bring them on board so that they can start implementing these uh, practices in their buildings and their classrooms as well. Fantastic. And Pam, any advice for the audience on how to build a, the model program that you have? I would just say that to, you got to build that capacity. And so if you want teachers to, to do this and allow them to get the training like Sally is talking about, put some money into it, uh, maybe even put some money into a teacher allotment. So the, I use a general ed teacher allotment for Sean's position. So principals can do things like that. And you have to invest in it if it's important with you. And then be clear about the expectations. If this is something that the school is doing, then be clear that those is your expectation and then celebrate it. Celebrate the work of the kids and certainly celebrate the work of the teachers as well. That's great. And Sean, anything else to end on advice that you give to teachers listening, administrators, how they can build this and, and create a vision like you have with your help with EduSize and IHT? I really like the idea of planting the seeds. I keep going back to like kindergarten, but I always wanted to be a kindergarten teacher when I started. So, but you know, it started out in a, in a garden and um, I spent 
half my time teaching in the garden as well. So I do really a lot of outdoor learning as well. But you know, any, any risks that you're going to take in the school, you have to start small and then you have to build and grow. And you have to admit to when you fail and when you're wrong and when something didn't work. Because you cannot guarantee that every program is going to work efficiently the first time. I know just when I started using the IHT bands and trying to go through the training and teach myself, it took, it took me to build a, a lot of capacity to do that. But the better, the more I practiced, the better I got. And anytime you're going to try to implement, whether it's kinesthetic learning, new STEM curriculum or social emotional learning, it's going to take time. But you find those, those leaders within your school. And that's really what we've done. We've, I've identified leaders that are very strong teachers, but who really have that same passion and energy. And you use those teachers to plant the seeds because that's when you get the greatest growth. And with, and honestly, with COVID, when that happened, I just trained the whole staff and 144 games that we implemented. So we didn't really get the whole fruition, and, um, but we're, we're gonna get there and we're gonna keep pushing forward. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, if you would like to reach out to Sean Spolsky, Dr. Sally Krill, Pam Kane, kind of learn more about this program, the innovation, um, their emails are there. And obviously with IHT and the way that we build partnerships with districts like Cobb County, with programs like EduSize, and we really sort of like listen and build and listen and build. So we are bringing our technology together with this curriculum. And as Sean mentioned, a year from now, starting in the in the semester, the fall semester of 2021. This will be something that will be available for our IHT customers to be able to participate, not only with our physical education lessons, our SEL lessons, but now a whole integration of EduSize to help optimize all aspects of learning. So I want to thank everybody who's been on the call. Um, and again, this will go out with we'll Jay Platkin, who's been behind the scenes running the show of kind of the backbone behind the curtain. We'll be sending out an email uh, that will have all of these resources and much more. And we look forward to having you reach out. Again, one of the things we do well is help you find the funding. And so we can sort of guide you through how do, how do you have this vision and then get the funding to be able to implement it. So thank you all so much. Um, on that note, I guess, Sean, do you have anything else to say? Were there any more uh, questions from the, the guest? I don't think we have any more questions, um, but I think, um, but if you do, you'll have our emails and we'll look forward to answering right. them after the fact. All right, Thank everybody, you all. thanks. Thank you. Have a great night.